So, um, good morning, everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce our um, super market panel today to close this conference. And uh, we have assembled uh, a, an impressive panel again um, of people that not only think about uh, the issues uh, we've been discussing so far, but also uh, put on money yeah, uh, and decisions uh, behind these issues. And uh, I'm very honored um, to have with me uh, today, and I will present them in more detail, but just to plant the scene. So uh, Luisa Gomez Bravo, your um, CFO um, at um, BBVA, yeah. And so in, in your case, this is a very, um, I would say, uh, a practical question, uh, bank funding, central bank reserves, uh, your funding in the market, yeah. Uh, and you're also a member of the executive committee of BBVA. But before becoming CS, uh, CFO, you have a distinguished career also in other institutions, Salomon Brothers, Lehman Brothers, and then at BBVA uh, as head of um, capital markets. Yeah. So on our side of things, so to speak, on capital markets as well. Um, then um, Gert-Jan Flieger. So you are vice chairman of Millennium. So also on the sides of putting on money on these <laughs> on these conjectures that we discussed, uh, so you you also have a very uh, varied career both in the public sector and in the private sector as well as the acad academic world, and um, you held roles at um, Element Capital, Braven Howard, Deutsche Bank but also importantly as a member of the MPC at the Bank of England, yeah? Uh, from 2015 to 2021. And you have published research largely focused on the importance of money, balance sheets and asset prices um, in the economy. Then I turn to the people that uh, probably Luisa and Gertian uh, listen to when they have to make decisions, yeah? And uh, these are, of course, um, hopefully central bankers and, uh, and, and also analysts um, in, the, uh, in the banking sector. So, um, Tony, Tony Gravel, uh, your deputy governor uh, at the Bank of Canada. And uh, you have worked uh, in a number of public sector institutions, the Canadian Ministry of Finance and the International Monetary Fund. And today, uh, your position as Deputy Governor includes uh, the office site of financial markets, but also banking and payments, yeah, as well as the bank's role in maintaining a stable and efficient financial system. And last but not least, Rohan Khanna, a number of people here read uh, your research. Yeah, um, so uh, you are head of European rates research at uh, Barclays um, Investment Bank, and you also have a distinguished career in Goldman Sachs and UBS previously. And uh, your research uh, goes into cash, derivative, and money markets um, in the euro area. So thank you to all of us for uh, joining us today for this uh, conversation. And um, the rules of the panel is that we decided to uh, to slice the conversation in three big blocks, yeah? And I think some of them mirror uh, the topics that we've been hearing about in the keynote speeches, in the panel discussion. So we start with... Um, the first topic will be, and announce the three topics and then how we go about it, uh, dialing back the central bank balance sheet. So Isabel's speech yesterday from the perspective of this panel and reducing excess liquidity in a post-great financial crisis world. And of course, we heard a lot about the interactions with regulation. Yeah. The second uh, block is um, going to center around the pricing of central bank facilities, central bank liquidity operations, and more generally the design of these, and how you set up the pricing and the design so that you also maintain market activity. Yeah? 
And then the third topic uh, will bring us to uh, market functioning and collateral in particular, the role of collateral, how we actually opened the academic sessions um, yesterday morning. For every block, um, I'll ask two lead speakers here uh, to kick off, and then of course the others can react. And uh, uh, the audience will have an opportunity to ask questions, so allocated 15 minutes at the end of the whole discussion, yeah? So uh, for the first question, which is really this kind of, you know, big picture question about dialing back the central bank balance sheets, reducing excess liquidity, what's the implications for financial markets, uh, and what's the interaction with regulation? Gertian, you can accept it to lead, and Tony as well, so the floor is yours. was a policymaker, I always have to say uh, the views uh, that I'm about to discuss are not those of the institution I work for. I'm going to say that again, uh, even though I work for a hedge fund, um, I'm speaking very much on my own behalf <coughs> rather than on behalf of the institution. Um, so I'm going to tackle three things very briefly. Uh, why, why are we not or unlikely to go back to pre-financial crisis balance sheets? Um, in the last 15 years, what have we learned about QE? And then lastly, what are the implications of those lessons for how we might uh, manage the balance sheet and in particular how we might or might not do QE in the future? So just, you know, this is straightforward, but I hope that soon I'm going to move into some things which are, which are not so obvious. Um, you know, how did we end up here uh, in the great financial crisis? Uh, there was a huge contraction in demand. Uh, central banks cut rates to the effective lower bound. They decided they wanted a lot more stimulus, uh, but couldn't achieve that with short-term interest rates, so massively expanded their uh, balance sheets. But that's not the only thing that happened. The great financial crisis exposed uh, some pretty serious inadequacies in regulation, and so in the post-financial crisis years, there was a huge effort to ramp up both uh, capital regulation and liquidity regulation. And it's precisely because of that liquidity regulation that it's unlikely that we will go back to the very small balance sheets that central banks had before. Um, why is it difficult to be precise about where we're going to end up with steady state balance sheets? Um, there are many reasons, but I think there are two big ones. Um, first is you can summarize as buffers on buffers. So you can calculate pretty straightforwardly what the liquidity requirements are for the banks. Um, but what is much harder to estimate is the fact that they don't hold that level of liquidity. They hold, in fact, a lot more. Uh, at the latest count in the Eurozone, about 160%. Uh, but a few years before that, it was 175%. And a few years before that, it was 150%. So the aggregate fluctuates a lot. The second reason why it's difficult to estimate is because of the composition. <laughs> because the liquidity regulation doesn't actually say how many reserves you should hold. It says how many high quality liquid assets you should hold. And reserves is only one component of that. And there's a lot of substitutability between reserves and other things. And so it's very difficult to estimate uh, in the equilibrium, new steady state, where, where will the reserves um, end up. Um, we are now and agonizing a little bit over you know, what that level will be. And that uncertainty over what that level will be is driving some uh, choices about how to organize the operational uh, framework of different central banks. And there's lots of intricate differences, uh, and we had a great presentation this morning trying to compare them. I think one refinement that I would put on Antoine's presentation is if you, if you can picture his graph uh, with the reserve demand schedule and the, the different central banks. Um, I would put a uh, vertical line where he put it for the Fed. I would put horizontal lines for the ECB and for the Bank of England. Uh, because the real innovation is the Fed is still saying, look, we don't know where that kink in the money demand uh, curve is. Um, you know, we think some bad things can happen when we get close to it. And so we want to stay far away from it. That's basically the, the strategy. The Bank of England and the ECB are saying, we're not so afraid of the kink. We have an on-tap facility, which we would actually like people to use. And we don't need to be so precise about where the kink is, because we will find out when people start using the facility. And because the facility will be part of the new steady state framework, we want it to be used all the time, 
We're just going to find out as we get closer. And then there's you know, some details about the width of the corridor, but I think that's less important. Um, in general, I do agree kind of with uh, Borio's idea that you know, there are many ways of organizing this, but in the end, you, know, you all end up in the same place. The one refinement that I would add is if you get this monetary framework stuff approximately right, then it really doesn't matter. Um, if you get it wrong, it matters a whole lot. Uh, and so there's a huge asymmetry. And so yeah, I wouldn't focus too much on the distinctions between the different central banks because I think you know, even though they all say this is optimal for my you know, conditions, you can probably interchange them and you wouldn't do too much damage. Um, but you need to be very aware of a system that is robust to particular spikes in, in liquidity demand. So that's my first point. My second point is um, what are the lessons from QE? So we've done roughly 15 years of this stuff, or we started roughly 15 years ago. And the old view of QE uh, was that you should think about buying a certain quantity of bonds will have a, an effect on uh, long-term yields, mostly via the term premium of X basis points and that is the equivalent of Y basis points of cuts in the short term rate. And lots of central banks worked with that framework for quite a long time. And it was a sort of an easy shorthand, easy to model, easy to communicate. But I think a lot of the evidence that we've had over that period shows that that framework is actually grossly inadequate, not to say wrong. Um, and I think a much more subtle view that is much more consistent with the evidence that we've seen is that QE has a huge and very important liquidity effect when financial markets are distressed, and it is incredibly useful during those periods, as well as having a signaling effect when money market curves are still upward sloping and people think that maybe the central bank is about to normalize rates, and by doing QE, you can convince them that that point is quite far away. But if you buy that framework, the implication is that when markets are functioning well, and the money market curve is already quite flat, I think that QE does very little in terms of macro stimulus. And I think that now, in retrospect, we actually wasted a lot of ammunition in those calm periods uh, when we were hoping that it would achieve something, but I think in the end it achieved uh, very little. So what's the implication of that for how we might use QE in the future? <clears throat> The kind of my big headline message is I think we really ought to think of QE as a financial stability tool, not as a macroeconomic stimulus tool. Um, and that's my first point. The second point is just because QE is a very powerful financial stability tool doesn't mean that in every crisis episode or in every episode of dysfunctional markets, you should use QE. And I think we should remind ourselves of kind of very old central banking lore, you know, not to say like one of the original commandments of central banking, which is that when there is a liquidity crisis, you should lend uh, against collateral. And I think we would do well to think, and central banks are doing this, but we need to continue on this agenda, to think more about when is it appropriate to buy and when is it appropriate to lend. And actually in some of the instances when central banks have bought, I think, in retrospect, it would have been more appropriate to lend. Maybe the, the opportunity wasn't there because the actors that we were trying to deal with were not counterparties, but the answer then surely is to try and think about whether they can become counterparties in the future rather than just keep buying at every sign of, uh, of trouble. Why do I think that we need to, you know, I, I'm, I'm very careful to say we shouldn't throw QE away as a tool, it's hugely important, and we're going to be using it. Uh, we should always have it uh, out there as a potential tool, but I think it's also important to minimize it and not to use it when it's not necessary, because the adverse consequences are pretty significant, and I, I will highlight just two. Um, central banks can lose a lot of money when they do QE in large quantities, and we have seen that that causes a lot of tension in relations with governments. The second one is central banks can also make a lot of money when they do QE, but I would argue that's also not necessarily a good thing. Because if you bought a distressed asset um, at a very low price and then made a lot of money, it means that the person you bought it for, from, who was a distressed financial market participant, actually lost a lot of money, 
or uh, had a big opportunity cost. And so both of those things are not good. Making a lot of money in QE is not good. Losing a lot of money in QE is not good. And when you lend whenever possible, then you avoid both of those scenarios. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much. Excellent start. Uh, Tony. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Yemen and the ECB for inviting me to uh, this great conference. Uh, I've learned it all already. Um, I'm always learning. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take off where uh, my colleague has ended. Uh, I'll start with QT. So QT is obviously not the reverse of QE. For some of the reasons you, you mentioned, uh, QE has, has sort of less bang for buck when uh, there's not a, the markets are fin uh, functioning well, so we're doing QT during a period of when markets are functioning well. QT are also, uh, we're doing QT in a, period, uh, in a very gradual manner, except for a few central banks. Uh, most, of, most of us are, are unwinding our asset portfolio in a passive manner, so it's very predictable. So that's also uh, very likely not to have a big impact on, uh, on uh, markets. And then QT, uh, in another sense, um, is, um, is basically uh, um, subservient. We're doing QT in a period where we're actually, the main tool is our policy, monetary policy tool, the, the interest rate, the target rate. Uh, that has much more uh, monetary policy transmission implications than uh, QT that's running in the background. So it's very much at the reverse. The one thing that QT does potentially uh, mean is that reserves are also declining for most central banks. It's not one for one. There's, a, there's other liabilities on most central banks' balance sheet. Uh, for example, we, our reserves have declined since, uh, actually, during, even during the COVID pandemic, we, were, we had a bunch of, we, we, did, we lent freely against collateral. At the beginning of the pandemic, we injected over 200 billion in term repos, and we also bought a bunch of assets, but those term repos unwound off our balance sheet pretty quickly, and the reserves came down. Uh, but for example, our assets have continued to come down this year by 40 to 50 billion uh, in amount, but our reserves has been relatively flat over the year. And one of the reasons is because uh, government uh, deposits on the central bank balance sheet have, uh, have declined uh, somewhat over the year as well, um, as well as currency increasing uh, slowly as well. Uh, so I think the, the main part of this conference has been about money markets and reserves and central bank implementation, um, monetary policy implementation frameworks. Uh, I agree, uh, a lot of us are, are leaning towards kind of similar shades of gray of demand-driven systems, apart from the US to some degree. Um, we all change, many of us change to a floor system coming out of uh, the COVID crisis uh, when we did QE in a big way and we had to inject a lot of liquidity into the banking system um, in, in quick order during the beginning of the COVID crisis. And we all thought, well, this is a good thing. I mean, you just set your policy rate at the deposit rate and you have a lot less volatility than you normally did in a corridor system. In a corridor system, you also had to really sort of have a good sense of what is the liquidity uh, needed to flatten out everybody's uh, payment-related needs for reserves. So that was a lot of work and uh, this, this is easy. I, I, we got rid of some operational folks in our teams. They're doing something else, <laughs> but they're not doing that. Um, but then, lo and behold, uh, some of our, well, at least some of us are starting to experience, we still have to intervene in uh, financial markets quite a bit. Um, some, uh, we, we don't know yet for some countries, ACB, the Eurozone, they're assuming that they're going to have some take up in the MRO, or you're increasing take up in the MRO, because the, the supply side is still far away from the kink. We are in Canada, for example, we're in a floor system. Uh, we have a, a weird demand-driven uh, framework, uh, not quite a pure one, um, and in part because we have our policy rate as the collateralized rate, not the unsecured rate. We, we target the overnight repo rate as our policy rate. Right now, our, we set the policy rate equal to the deposit rate. We hope that the repo market, overnight repo market rate is right on that, that that uh, policy rate, but over the last, um, since July roughly, we've seen upper pressure on our Cora benchmark, which is in, uh, sorry, uh, our benchmark is called Cora. It's the SOFR comparable, if you will. Uh, so we've seen the, the market rate, which is Cora, the Cora benchmark, moving away from our policy rate. 
It's been averaging plus five basis points away from our policy rate on average. Uh, we've been intervening daily uh, in the overnight repo market to inject liquidity over that period, uh, just to keep it relatively close to reinforce our policy target. Uh, and this is in a, in a period where we think we're still in, in massively excess reserves. We're, we're more where the US is or more where the ECB is. We're not close to the kink. Uh, we estimate, uh, and we're probably one of the only central banks that went on a limb, we estimate they would probably be uh, stop QT when we hit somewhere between 20 to 60 billion of reserves in our balance sheet. Right now we have about 110 billion. Um, uh, so why are we intervening in uh, overnight market. Um, well, one is that there's been a huge increase in funding demand in Canada from a set of participants, um, hedge funds in particular. It's like uh, 18 months ago, hedge funds discovered Canada. Um, <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> they, 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 they went, hey, there's a country on top of the US. And uh, well, to, to, I'm being facetious. Uh, one of the reasons is that our futures contracts on, on uh, Government Canada bonds became much more liquid. Um, our, our, our futures exchange introduced some new variations of the contracts and they, and they became much more liquid and that helps hedge funds to participate in a basis trade. Also during the COVID crisis, uh, our government issued a lot more debt and that the government bond benchmark sizes grew. So it also helps uh, hedge funds be more active and that kind of attracted them. The other reasons why they're much more active and where they're much more on uh, funding long positions where they need to borrow and repo to buy the underlying government Canada bond is that because uh, the interest rate environment is such that it's been declining since roughly since July, maybe off and on maybe since January. Uh, that they're just taking a view and it's, it's a much more profitable view if and, and it's much more profitable to do the basis to some degree, or it's less risky to do the basis if you think uh, government bond yields are, are going to decline. So there's been a huge uh, increase in repo market funding uh, since that period. Uh, the other thing that's different in Canada is that we, again, target the collateralized rate. So our facility is not a pure reserve supplying facility, <coughs> like is envisioned in I think at the ECB, I'll, I'll do that. It's, it's, it does double duty, if not more focus on supplying repo funding. So it, it's not a pure result. So it's, that's why it's a one day reserve, uh, sorry, a one day facility that supplies repo. And um, it, uh, it, it, does, it does supply reserves, but it's one day they supply work and we're doing it every day. So maybe on average, we're kind of supplying reserves, but really it's aimed at uh, pushing repo rates back down towards our policy rate. I'll, I'll stop there and we'll, we'll uh, I was going to say, exactly. I, saw, I saw you mentioned <laughs> the mic, so. No, but excellent planting of the, of the scene. And by the way, I mean, on, on hedge funds, I mean, we published a blog post uh, recently on the ECB website on the uh, presence in um, government bond markets and, and repo markets. So I want to give, you know, uh, also a chance to our other panelists to jump in and we'll go directly actually to uh, the second blog on pricing of central bank liquidity um, operations and market activity. And um, Rohan and also Tony, you accepted to lead, but I'll start with Rohan and then Tony, you can add. And of course, then we'll be very happy to hear from Luisa and Gertian again. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, as far as um, Europe is concerned, and there was a chart in Isabel's presentation yesterday that most market funding based funding solutions are still a lot cheaper than where the MRO rate is. Now, from our perspective, when the ECB was deciding its operational framework review, one of our key suggestions was to narrow the corridor so that you kind of prevent that asymmetric risk that Jan spoke about. You, when you get something wrong, that markets hit an air pocket and repo rates just blow up. So you kind of create a much narrower ceiling as you move towards a less ample reserve regime. But so far, clearly, uh, the, the demand in any of the ECB's refinancing operations has been fairly limited. But it's, the pricing of this is one aspect. The second aspect is banks really don't need the money because when you think about Eurozone economy, uh, we've been in a period of stagnation. Credit growth is very weak. Loan to deposit ratios are below 100. 
And this speaks to the fragmentation we see in excess liquidity distribution, the fragmentation you see in how HQLA portfolios are skewed between cash and reserves versus bonds, and you take this straight into where loan to deposit ratios are. So you can see loan to deposit ratio in a country like Finland is well above 100, but in Greece it's just 50%. So Greek banks are sitting with so much deposits and are happy to move them into GGBs or any other fixed income instrument. And as you see this HQLA rotation happening, they've run down reserves, paid back to LTRO money, but at the same time, they've taken government bond holdings in their HQLA to up to 50%. So given the state of the economy, given the lack of credit growth, and given how well-funded well banks are, from a loan to deposit ratio, so far we've not come down to the point where the need to access ECB facilities is, is, is uh, really presenting itself. The pricing is clearly attractive, but we've heard a lot over the last two days about stigma associated with central bank facilities. And, and maybe we'll touch upon this in the next point, uh, in the next section, but I mean, we've seen a cheapening in repo rates to the point Tony was making. And despite this cheapening, the, in, the willingness of banks to come to the ECB to fund themselves is really not there. And if I take a liquidity, as, liquidity regulation aspect to this, right? So Jan mentioned that the LCR ratio in Eurozone at an aggregate level is about 160%. Now, if you think about the MRO facility, and this was the last paper presented yesterday, and I apologize for going back and forth because the best minds have already spoken. I'm just summarizing their views, really. That liquidity transformation view was very important because that is what LCR is really about. And if LCR is 160%, you don't really need to go into the MRO facility. And Basel, in LCR, has a very nice, a very nice angle to accessing central bank facilities. So in LCR regulation, whether you access a facility that is one day, one week, one month, it doesn't matter. You get a 100% rollover rate in your calculations, which is fantastic for banks. But you first need to be LCR constrained to really go there. And given that banks have ample LCR, there is no need to go there. Now this is the difference versus, say, the STR facility with the BOE. Now in STR, the collateral you're posting is high quality collateral. So it's a high quality for high quality swap. So you're not really participating, participating in the STR from a regulatory perspective. This is no LCR benefit to you. But when they come to the ECB, because the collateral pool is a lot wider, the liquidity transformation angle kicks in right away. And so, so the need to go into these facilities, whether it is a one week facility or a three month facility or whenever the structural refinancing operation comes into play will also depend upon which ratio is binding. Is it LCR or is it NSFR? As things stand, there is no facility across any central bank that gives NSFR benefit. And that's why the ECB has spoken about structural refinancing operations. Governor Bailey's speech spoke about what comes after ILTR and if there's a new operation needed to address NSFR liquidity. Let me stop there. Sure. Um, I don't know if I'll follow <laughs> exactly on that. I, I'll go back to the monetary policy implementation <laughs> frameworks. Um, one of the things, so we're intervening every day. One of the things we're thinking about is in a future steady state, uh, when the hedge funds have decided to do different trading, um, we want we want a monetary policy information framework that's that's good for all these environments. Um, and then we've been looking at our colleagues in other central banks, and uh, we'll, what what is our, our ultimate objective in having a monetary policy implementation framework? One is to lean against precautionary motives for reserve demand. Just lean against it, not, not eliminate it, but lean against it. Uh, make sure there's a sufficient amount of reserves for payment motivated ones, which we think is quite modest, a very small amount. So we want to create incentives for uh, commercial banks uh, to, to conserve on the precautionary motive for uh, reserves. 
And at the end of the day, what matters is a little bit what the ECB already has is this sort of uh, playing with the opportunity cost of reserves. Um, so there's opportunity cost of reserve right now in Canada uh, and a downward sloping yield curve that's downward sloping near the front end are quite low. I mean, why, why wouldn't you hold uh, reserves if it's, they're paying at, uh, well, they were paying at, at a higher level than their two year, now they're roughly equivalent. You just hold the reserves all day. Um, but when, when uh, the, the central bank balance sheet continues to decline uh, and we want to get to an indeterminate level, that's the, that's the beauty of the demand driven thing. It's an, the ultimate steady state level of balance sheet is indeterminate. But you still want commercial banks not to, to sort of factor in the cost of holding uh, reserves uh, for precautionary reasons. So you, you need to have sort of some sort of carry. And you want to play with that, that calibration. And the ECB, they've decided it's 15 basis point, the carry. Uh, right now, the, our carry is zero. We, we set the overnight uh, minimum bid lim, uh, uh, for our auctions for overnight re reserves at the same uh, minimum, at the same rate as our deposit rate, and this, which is the same as our target rate. Um, but we've been thinking a lot about it going forward when the balance, uh, when we're keen to, to make sure that uh, banks are conserving um, or reducing the uh, precautionary demand for their, their reserves and we're leaning into that, we really want to en enhance market discipline. That's where we're coming from. Make sure they manage their liquidity in, certain, in a certain uh, effective way. And, and then to do that, we're starting to think about um, is that, do we want to create what, <laughs> what my colleagues call a Florador? <laughs> <laughs> you want some sort of, in this case, or, or carry. Some sort of corridor or some carry between uh, the, the reserve supplying uh, rate facility and the reserve, uh, the, the, the interest rate you pay on that. Because if, if a, a bank is short reserves, it'll go in and pay a higher rate. So they'll think about it because once they get it on their balance sheet, they're, they're losing, well, they've lost some money already because you pay 15 basis points higher for borrowing than, uh, than the interest rate you get. Uh, so we've been thinking a lot about that. No, thanks, and I think it's quite similar to what we have, I think. But I wanted to exactly turn to you, because you heard LCR <laughs> trends, you heard loan uh, to deposit ratio, so Luisa. Yes, well, um, I think, are we on the second topic or on the third topic? Or on the, do you want me to, to react on the second? I wanted to react on that, yes. Yeah. Uh, I think that, um, but to, to us, uh, you know, as banks, and at least the way we see it is this, this concept of, first of all, it, it's true that we have ample liquidity. So the concept of needing to um, access uh, central bank liquidity is not on the table. Um, and as a matter of fact, when you look at how we are, um, how we are dimensioning the liquidity, you know, buffers that we need, it's really all about our liabilities and the deposits. It's not about the reserves. So I don't, we don't start saying, okay, this is the amount of reserves that I need to have and then circle all the way back to you know, how I manage liabilities. It's really, especially in, in banks again, um, with, because if you're looking at retail banks versus wholesale banks, that's also a very significant difference because the wholesale businesses are gonna have to rely more on repos than the retail banks, which rely more on the sticky uh, transactional deposits. If you look at a bank like us, about 65% you know, of our balance sheet is really um, customer deposits, of which two thirds is retail deposits, of which 50% is insured deposits. So the way we manage liquidity is really trying to project the stability of those core deposits, of those stable deposits, feeding back into the uh, LCR ratios. So uh, that's one topic. Then the second topic with regards to reserves and, and, and HQLA, really from our point of view, they, we, don't, um, we don't put more of a focus on one or the other. They're valued one on one. And as a matter of fact, right now we are, you know, significantly holding much more you know, government bonds than, than, than reserves, but it is true that depending on the repo markets, we can, we can position that liquidity differently. But really for us, it's about the deposits and the liabilities, the movement of those, um, and, and relying uh, as little as possible in short-term funding. So we have a cap on short-term funding 
um, so that we don't over rely from a liquidity perspective on having to access the short-term funding markets. So those are the principles. And obviously the group BBVA also is an MPE bank. We have liquidity, um, you know, self-funding decisions at the different banks that we have in the emerging markets and in Europe. So that is also something that we look into, you know, how to, how to ensure the liquidity access to the different banks on their own levels. No. But I think to that point, what's, what's important for us uh, from that perspective is really on the LCR, the access to the central bank. As, so there are two things on, on the back of the two, thing, two, two comments that have been made, the two blocks. One is, as liquidity starts coming down, as the QT comes down, comes down one of my questions is, because uh, to, to your point, the liquidity is heterogeneously distributed in, in Europe. As you reach your minimum level of reserves, whatever that may be, you're going to start having tensions, potentially, in different markets, right? And so my question there, is that going to generate or accelerate the requirement to access the TPI? sooner than you would have thought because you start having, you know, um, more tensions in the sovereign yields in, in, you know, in a Europe that still has fragmented liquidity. So that's my, my, that would be my question, which I don't have an answer to, but that would be my question there. Mm. And the second thing is really stigma is really, 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 really important for banks. <laughs> it's not, I mean, there's a lot of talk about stigma, but it is really mm. something that we, when we're looking at decisions, we really take into account. And the stigma comes, so it's not just about, so the long-term harm, the long-term reputational harm from accessing central bank liquidity versus the short-term funding savings is something that unless there's a lot of um, marketing, a lot of uh, education, a lot of, you know, if you don't work on that side, it's, it's going to be difficult to manage. And on the terms, and, and with regards to the cost, cost is also very relevant for the stigma side. Because if you don't have that, if you have that negative carry, and the cost starts to be too high versus the policy rate or the market rate, then it's just going to generate more stigma because you actually have to access the policy at an even a higher rate. So, so it's a double whammy. So I, I would also put emphasis on this concept that stigma for banks, and it needs to be resolved. I think there's no easy way to resolve it. Um, I'm sure there are different you know, options in terms of how you operate in the market, whether it's through clearing houses or not, and all that stuff. But I think really it's about ensuring that we work slowly as you're doing the QT in this passive way in, in the ECB to ensure that the market is ready for starting to access the liquidity in a non-stressful, non-stress scenario. Because if you need to access the liquidity when there's a specific stress, going back to my point of potential stress as you do the QT in a fragmented uh, liquidity scenario, it's going to be a moot point. You're never going to get through the stigma problem. Yeah, thanks a lot for explaining all this so clearly. Yeah? And Gertian, you want to react? <laughs> I, I, I wanted to comment on this, uh, on this stigma thing. So um, I'm, I'm just going to be very naive and, and, and pretend that I don't understand it. Um, I know it's real because <laughs> Louisa has just said it's real. But it seems to me like it's just a hangover from the days when a central bank facility meant something like you know, a discount window facility that you had to go to when you were in trouble and you had managed something badly or people had lost confidence in you. But surely once central banks say, look, this is the new way in which everybody is going to access reserves. There are no other ways to get the reserves rather than through this facility. That doesn't seem like a really difficult thing to understand where people say, oh, okay, so I'm now doing this every week. It's not because I'm in trouble. It's because this is the new, you know, this is the ATM. This is how, how I finance my normal activity. Yeah. The question is, how long does it take us to pass the message, yeah? And I think, you know, when I, I was in New York uh, two weeks ago, and the number of times that I heard stigma also associated not only to the discount window, but to the, um, basically, the new facility, the standing repo facility, uh, was really surprising to me. Mm. So I think we need to do a lot more education, and people need to listen <coughs> to us a lot more as well, yeah? I mean... People being mainly rating agencies, investors. Yeah, we were discussing, uh, uh, especially when they look at banks' um, disclosures. So maybe we go to you know the, the third part because I want to leave our audience, and I see a lot of people reacting in the audience. Also, time to ask questions. And um, in the last uh, uh, last block on market functioning and collateral, I wanted to ask 
in particular, Louisa, you, about you know, the importance of collateral today in a bank. Is collateral eligible collateral becoming the gold standard? I mean, you manage this collateral in a very you know, savvy, efficient way, and you tried to get it always maybe ready to access the central bank. How does it work? Yeah, no, totally. I mean, I think the new, in, the new, in this brave new world, <laughs> Um, of liquidity management for banks uh, with regulatory uh, compliance, um, as part of the flip side of the LCR is obviously you, you need to be, it's become a key part of your liquidity management, the ability to generate collateral and mobilize collateral. So that has been very, very relevant in a world, and I know that, you know, I'll caveat this, no, but, the, but collateral is a scarce concept. It, you know, it's a limited resource, let's call it that way. And I put the caveat on the scarce resource because if you're going through QT, we're already starting to see sort of a soft evolution of this concept of HQLA scarcity um, as we are seeing that, you know, some of that HQLA, in, especially in Europe where you have, you know, large uh, fiscal deficits that need to be re refinanced, that there could be HQLA available at lower costs and we're seeing, to start seeing green sprouts around that. But in overall, in general, it's gonna be a scarce concept. So for us, I think what is, what is very relevant as we generate a mobilized collateral is really to be able to, what we would like to have is to be able to have a framework of uh, non-HQLA uh, collateral available. Um, and that this would be implemented also as well as the implementation of ECMS takes place. Why? Because at the end of the day, uh, you know, banks are sitting uh, on a lot of, you know, today non-eligible uh, collateral. It's, um, if you are able to broaden the pool of eligible collateral, it, it, you know, makes liquidity management easier for the institutions. And I think it also decreases, especially when we're talking about credit claims, you know, for banks. Especially, I think it would decrease also concentration risk because you would have, you know, you, you would distribute the reliance of collateral amongst a broader array of asset classes and issuers. I think it would enhance market stability because if you have a specific stress on a single asset, it wouldn't necessarily generate a systemic uh, risk. And in a case of stress scenario or, or tightening of liquidity, you know, institutions would have an easier access to that, to that liquidity. And I align it and I insist on the ECMS um, side because I think it's, it's very vital for, you know, the resilience of the markets to have, you know, a system like, you know, the, the, um, the, the ECMS. So that's uh, our future a harmonized collateral system Correct. for the non-European. Sorry, yes. the European collateral management system, to your point, Iman, because we think harmonization is very, very relevant. And within that context, <coughs> the, the European collateral management system would allow, obviously, and allows, obviously, uh, you know, an easier access to Eurozone collateral in a harmonized way. But I think for banks, what's more relevant as well is the standardization and automation of the mobilization of collateral because it would reduce the manual processes and it would reduce the operational risk. And if we include this non-HQLA concept, the admission of non-HQLA collateral, it would harmonize best practices and mobilize in a speedier fashion that collateral if it's within that concept of a standardized, harmonized uh, you know, approach. So I think that's, that's very relevant for us. This concept of prepositioning of liquidity, the banks actually, after the repayment of TLTRO, and it's our case, have been prepositioning liquidity in the central banks uh, of non-HQLA uh, assets. Um, and I think that that's, that's true. But I think if you're gonna, in, in this debate of increased liquidity buffers on the back of prepositioning of collateral, you need to start, you know, you really need to think about new collateral. So we would have to generate new collateral for added liquidity buffers. And in that case, what we would say is, let's focus again on the non-HQLA uh, collateral. And then to the last point, the haircuts, which ties into this as well. Haircuts, I think, is very important that they are as transparent and clear for the entities as possible. And I think here, thinking more on a stress scenario, where you have clearing houses that, you know, obviously in the stress scenario, 
increase the haircut significantly, generate percyclicality in a situation of stress, having the availability of having a central bank with stable haircuts on non HQA assets. Or decreasing. We ease, we, we or, decrease or decreasing. The you decrease the, the haircuts in the, in the COVID, but if you have a clear haircut that is known, it allows to diversify that situation, and the financial institutions could determine very easily how much liquidity they have. And, and it would incentivize the, actually the generation of better quality assets. So before we open up to the audience, Rohan, I want to ask you, and of course, Tony and Gertian and, and Wiza, you can jump in in one minute, about how do you assess the state of functioning of money markets today? <coughs> I mean, I think the main stress, or if I can call that stress that's happening is in the fact that secured rates or repo rates have been cheapening and cheapening at a very fast pace. Right? There was a very nice chart in, in Isabel's presentation yesterday that showed how quarter end average of repo rates has evolved. And if I can take my 30 seconds and, and really not even speak about quarter ends, but explain a, a, in a very simple way how macro meets them very micro in repo. And when I say very micro, I'm gonna to talk to you only about an year end turn, which is three days, right? So go back, let's go back to 2022, <laughs> the year where central banks were hiking rates at a very fast pace. Short positioning was very dominant in the market. So come year end, you need to net those positions down because banks will tell you, we are the best. Please come and do all your business with us. But come year end, I need you netted down, else my balance sheet bloats. <coughs> So the demand for collateral in year end of 22 was so big that a three day turn in German collateral was priced at Esther minus 400. 2023, central banks were slowing down the pace of rate hikes. People thought, oh, bonds are gonna start rallying again. That's what history tells us. So positioning became a lot more neutral. <laughs> year end turn in 2023 was <coughs> Esther minus 65. And now the, micro cycle, the macro cycle has changed. <coughs> Central banks are cutting rates. And, <coughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Central banks are cutting rates and the, the positioning has pivoted long. That was to, to Tony's point on what's impacting Cora, that positions, everyone is long everything and these positions need to be funded and as things stand, in the, German, in the German GC market, a three day turn is going at Esther plus 80. So we've gone from Esther minus 400 to Esther plus 80. This is a, in, my, in my very simple terms, this is a very fascinating way of how the macro meets the very, very micro. And yesterday, Daryl spoke about the, the significant treasury issuance that has hit the market, which has made intermediation very difficult. And I leave you with one fact. The net EGB supply that has to be absorbed <coughs> by private market participants between 23, 24, and 25 is almost two trillion. We will have to go back two decades, 20 years of accumulating net supply to come up with the same number in Europe. So two decades worth of net EGB issuance is hitting the market in a three year window. So the, the, the cheapening in repo rates or the repo rates moving higher is basically a realization of the <coughs> fact that more and more and more debt is coming to the market. And hence the funding cost of that debt has to reflect that reality. Yeah, and I think, I mean, just to say, I mean, of course, the topic of market absorption, Isabel has shown yesterday, I think so far we are satisfied <coughs> with the market absorption, but obviously we'll be also watchful with what you just mentioned. Um, Tony Gertian, before we open the floor, state of money markets, you want to say in one minute? Um, well, I mean, in terms of functioning, I think we, uh, the, the, all the money markets seem to be functioning quite well. There's not a lot of gapping. There's this slow grind and we have the turn effects. I guess one thing from a central bank perspective that we always worry about is that we have a monetary policy. So there's, there's concerns related to um, back back uh, sort of financial stability facilities that need to kick in when there's a, 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 some sort of liquidity stress in the financial system. Usually it usually shows up in the money markets first versus a, a, a set of facilities that are there for day-to-day -day business as usual, monetary policy implementation. 
the issue in, in all of jurisdictions, and this overlaps with stigma, is that if you have a facility that you're selling as a, a backstop facility for financial stability stress, it's going to cap rates, it's going to help inject liquidity, and you have to make sure that you have another facility that's very clearly a business as usual, um, uh, monetary policy implementation facility, and, and sometimes that's very difficult because yeah. the terms are very similar. Uh, if you don't watch your language, you have some, some issues and in, in, uh, what you think is a monetary policy implementation facility is actually viewed from the market participants, uh, certain banks. Uh, I think Terrell said that there, if, you, if you talk to another part of the bank, it's viewed as a backstop facility. If you talk about, uh, to uh, another part of the bank, it's you, uh, the dealer part, it's, used, uh, it's thought of as a monetary policy implementation facility. So uh, all these issues are, are really, we really have to think about when we yeah. implement monetary policy frames. And when we design facilities, yes. this polymorph nature of, of central bank uh, facilities, get on. Um, I'll just make one observation. So when we were in the phase of adding uh, lots of QE, uh, keeping rates very low or cutting them, um, one way I think about it is you have the policy rate, which is sort of one anchor, and then you have a whole spectrum of money market and funding rates. And in general, what we were doing is the policy rate was here, and all these other funding rates were going lower and lower, and that was exactly what we wanted because yeah, we were easing. We to uh, then we were tightening and unwinding QE, and the policy rate was here, and relative to that policy rate, all these funding rates were going higher and higher, and that was also exactly fine because it was all going in the same direction. Now we're in a slightly different situation where we are easing the policy rate but still tightening the funding conditions, and so it's becoming a little bit more subtle and you know, the, we need to be a, a little bit more precise about like, you know, how many rate cuts or how many rate hikes worth of tightening is this? Uh, and do we actually need to take that into account when we decide interest rate policy? Yeah. I think that's a great way to start also uh, asking if there are questions uh, with this paradox. So, yeah, Jacques, Jacques, are you? Hi, hi, Jacques Caillou. I'd like to come back to the stigma question, if possible. Um, having worked 15 years ago in a bank that for a few weeks had the largest balance sheet on the planet and lost access uh, to the market three months later, uh, stigma and, uh, is important. Uh, so I don't think that the demand-led system can suppress the stigma problem, so I can see everyone swimming in the same operations and we don't know who's swimming naked and not. But I think that in the context of fragmentation risks, um, the changes in demand will be where the market will be focused on. And so there's an adverse selection problem uh, in a context of asymmetry of information. The market needs to understand why the delta has increased so much at either the country level or the bank level within the monetary system of the Eurozone. And so it's absolutely critical that there is signaling that will help understand that these demands are not related to market pressure or issues related to funding, but just the normal demand that has the ebb and flow. Uh, markets are very good to speculate on problems, and so they shoot first before uh, knowing whether there is a true problem or not. And I don't think that the system as it stands has eliminated that uh, issue. No, thanks a lot. And I think there's this question also of a first mover problem, you know, um, going to the MRO, everybody says, yeah, we will go when we need it, but, you know, somebody has to open it up, so to speak, yeah? So who wants to react on, on stigma and uh, whether we are not fooling ourselves saying that there's no stigma? <laughs> I, I think <clears throat> it's really about how you manage the decrease in liquidity and the decrease in LCRs ratios, no? I mean, I'm just brainstorming here, but, but if you, again, going back to the QT and the velocity, if you, if, if, and the fragmentation in Europe, if LCR ratio starts decreasing significantly, by the time you access the facility, it's going to be a stigma. So if you suddenly move from 180 to, in two years' time, 100, yeah. then by the time you're accessing that day to day, yeah. You're going to have, so the issue is when can or when should or how do we incentivize, you know, banks to participate when they're still at 120, 130, 
and you generate that view in the market that that's sort of a business as usual, so that then you manage from the 120, 130 to down to the 100 through other means. Because if you wait until the banks, which I'm, I'm in a bank, I'm not going to, you know, my optimal decision is not to go to the central bank until, I'm at 100, until I need to. Even from, you know, from that, unless there's a huge incentive from a cost perspective or, you know. So, so I think that's the only way because then, you know, to the point that we, you know, we think that we're mature, but then, you know, then things like, you know, the crisis last year and, you know, and it happens and you see one of the largest institutions in Europe. And, and the problem is that the, the, the markets, as you were saying, they, they shoot. And you see that in a market like the CDS and the CDS going up significantly, which is actually not, it wasn't a very liquid market either. So you have other players playing into that market and moving it. And the market sees, oh my God, the CDS is, so forget about the stigma of going to the central bank. That's too late already. So I, I think that's, you know, it's not an easy, I, I don't know what the solution is, but uh, yeah. So we're gonna take Isabel. <laughs> Uh, so thanks, thanks for the great panel. Uh, I actually wanted to react to you uh, immediately. So wouldn't it be um, the best thing to do to, to really move early and access early at a time when it's absolutely clear that you don't have to? So wouldn't that be the optimal strategy for, for everybody? Just when you, you know, your LCR is high, everything is, is, is perfect. So wouldn't, I mean, because otherwise if, if you wait, I mean, it's, it's uh, for you it becomes very hard. So I, I think from the viewpoint of a bank, it should just be the other way around. You should move early. Yeah, I mean, that, but then again, that's, that's to the point of the cost and the efficiency of the cost of the liquidity. And it goes also to the point of, um, what, of the actual uh, repo market health, you know, because, uh, you know, there's a d double side to it, you know, that, that if you move too quickly, then you could be affecting also the, the, the repo markets, no? So, I mean, it's, it's moving the pieces. It's, the, it's really, I think, the pace. The end situation or the desirable end situation would be that, and banks want to have as many uh, you know, tools in the toolbox as possible. And if this is a part of the toolbox, it's gonna be great. And, and then the banks decide how to manage the toolbox. What is difficult for banks is they, that you know, regulators want banks to be more and more and more sound with more and more liquidity buffers and liquidity buffers. And you have you know, different players in the markets, you know, where you're translating that, that liquidity with a problem as well in translating that liquidity, which actually has capital implications or rating, credit rating agency implications. And the financial stability problem goes to somewhere else. So it's really you know, a pace and ensuring that the banks can have you know, the adequate level of requirements and the toolbox to be able to deploy. No? I just wanted to um, speak on the pricing point that Luisa is saying. I mean, if we look at across geographies, side deposits are a significantly large part compared to time deposits. And in Spain and Italy, side deposits don't, earn, don't pay any interest. So the incentive for them to go to ECB, to, even if ECB is cutting rates, is really non-existent. So when we, when we try and think about how, what is the signal that reserve scarcity is starting to bite and banks are feeling some stress, we would first be tracking the evolution of deposit rates and deposit volumes. And this was to your point yesterday, Isabel, where you said, will Esther show that or not? Mm -hmm. But with Esther, you are talking about wholesale overnight deposits, which is very, very small. So I don't feel that is the hill banks will fight the battle for liquidity on. They would be much better off doing it in retail and in term deposits, which will bring regulatory benefits also rather than doing it in, in overnight. So when we are looking at signs of scarcity and how banks are responding, alongside credit creation, I would also look at what is happening on deposit pricing. So I want to have uh, the time to take two more questions. Um, I'll ask Louisa a question then. Okay, <laughs> oh my God. Um, if the MRO was, uh, had some value in terms of the LCR calculation, would, would, the, would that be a stigma issue? So you mean if the recourse if, to the MRO the re had an had LCR sort of benefit? LCR if it has benefit. LCR benefits, it's a different story. It banks be? are very conditioned about the regulatory LCR ratios and requirements. So anything that helps um, 
incorporate instruments into that calculation would be, yeah. would be useful, I would say. Yeah. It, would, it, it would be hard to see it being stigmatized in that case. Uh, if it's part of your it's, regulatory it's capabilities, yeah. yeah. I think if the regulatory framework endorses a little bit more explicitly, you know, central bank recourse, um, yeah. it's not a bad idea. <laughs> Instead of looking askance at it. <laughs> <laughs> Just looking if there's a last question. Yes, Thomas, please. Thank you. So I, I, I wanted to come back, uh, Rowan, to what you said about uh, repo markets and, and, and reporting dates and, and year ends. Um, and, and I wanted to ask two, two points. One is, from, from a, a systemic perspective and from a monetary policy transmission perspective, how um, dramatic is it that you have spikes in year ends or, or quarter ends? Should we I mean, to me, it, it, it um, would be much more important to see what the trend is in, in the, rest of the rest of the time. And the other point is I would like to uh, maybe ask you for your thoughts about uh, the symmetry or lack of symmetry in terms of concern uh, between the case where you had uh, expensive mm. versus uh, cheap repo. Sorry, the last part was expensive versus? Versus cheap repo. So cheap repo, okay. the, the 22 uh, yes. phenomenon versus the potentially uh, 24 phenomenon. Sure. What, what, what is more of a concern sure. and, and why? I mean, on your first point, I'll say that as a central banker, you shouldn't bother about three day turns. It is what it is. And the CIP paper that was published before that effectively tells you that regulation causes this. The ECB has written blog posts about window dressing on LCR, about how Esther moves a lot around reporting dates. So this is just the part and parcel of the world we live in. So I don't think it matters. The trend, of course, is the focus. And that comes to your second question about, should we be worried about cheaper repo or, 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 more, or um, rep low repo rates or high repo rates? The point I would say is, when there is collateral scarcity and repo rates are low or rich, the ECB, the national, national financing agencies can do something about it. So last time in 2022, you made your securities lending operations a bit more easier to tap. The Bundesbank, if I'm not mistaken, widened counterparty lines to allow people to, to access. The finance agency, the finance agency uh, increased, uh, made it easier to, to, to give out their own bonds. But when we are on this side of the puzzle, it becomes very difficult because now, the, the one option I would say is restart QE. That is not gonna solve it. Even stopping QT is not going to solve it. And let me go a step further. Tomorrow, if the ECB decides to launch a, a, a 100 billion Teltro operation, it will not solve the year-end problems because the year-end problems come down to regulation, balance sheet netting. They've got absolutely nothing to do with lack of liquidity. People who have liquidity, it's, it's all well and good, but that is a very market positioning problem, which excess liquidity, which is already excess, is real. And addition, uh, another 100 on top of the 3 trillion that is already there is really not going to solve that problem. Yeah. Any last uh, word? I mean, if not, I think it's fascinating to close on this link between, um, you know, market intermediation mm -hmm. and the level of liquidity, yeah? I mean, maybe what we're discussing about having a constraint on liquidity is actually also has to be seen from a constraint on market intermediation as well. So thank you. Thank you to all my panelists very much. Uh, it's been a really challenging, fascinating um, conversation. So now I'm going to very officially close um, the conference. But, uh, uh, I know that I'm sitting between or standing uh, between you and lunch, uh, so it's going to be very, very uh, short. Just to say that I really um, personally enjoyed very much uh, all uh, the uh, presentations, speeches, uh, uh, discussions um, over these past two days. I think it's been a very successful um, edition. 
And one of the reasons is you have people in the background that are actually organizing um, all of this event, yeah? And I wanted to you know, pay tribute um, to the very dedicated organizing team, which is sitting here uh, on, the, on the front row, yeah? Uh, also wanted to, uh, to thank uh, in the back over there, we have uh, our trainees with the uh, now the famous uh, blue sweater uh, or blue fleece uh, market operations, if you uh, come closer. Uh, so thank you very much for everything uh, for everything you've done and for uh, keeping everything running um, so smoothly. And I'd like to invite you for a round of applause uh, for them and for the program. And so, of course, I hope that you leave with the idea that next year, at the same time, uh, you will be here again and uh, continue to, um, to participate in our debates. And now, uh, let me just uh, tell you that uh, the slides, the videos, the pictures, uh, they are very nice pictures uh, from today and yesterday, uh, will be available uh, within the next week. Some of them are already available, so keep an eye on uh, our website. And then uh, let me also wish you, of course, safe travels and uh, invite you to uh, the lunch, which is served as a buffet um, outside this room. Thanks a lot.